History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We're digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. I'm Phil. And I'm Matt. We're not historians. We're just two guys who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is George Washington's Runaway Slave. So, Phil, when you think of the words founding fathers, what are some of the adjectives or descriptors that come to mind? These are the patriarch of our country, the most important men in America, right? Infallible founding fathers, framers of the Constitution. They knew better than anyone, and whatever they put into writing, the day that our country was made still stands true and is the best thing that we have to go off of today. All right. And I think that's something that a lot of Americans would agree with. I don't necessarily disagree with that sentiment um, as part of a whole description. I think that there were certain risks they took in, you know, starting the revolution and deciding to stand up to the British Because many of them, especially those at the front, like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, if they had lost the war, were captured by the British, would have been, you know, horribly tortured and killed. So they were risking a lot when they started to form the idea of the United States and subsequently went to war with the British to try to start that country. But as we've heard several times this year with all of the Black Lives Matter racial learning that I think a lot of our society has done in the last, I don't know, 12 to 16 months. We've heard several times over about how many of the founding fathers were involved in the slave trade or owned slaves or benefited from the institution of slavery. And today we're going to be talking about one of those slaves that belonged to a founding father. But before we get to her story, I kind of wanted to just go over the basics of our founding father's involvement in the slave trade, in slavery. Yeah, I want to clarify that I don't necessarily agree with everything I I just said. (laughs) I mean, I definitely tried to make it glossy to go along with, you know, what some people might say about our founding fathers. And there is, you were right, there is certain courage and, you know, it, it takes a lot to abandon everything that you've known as your home country and you know fight for your freedom and to start something new but that's not to say that they are these infallible gods of civilization like they clearly were human and had errors and as we're about to get into some of their more like how they treated other people is one thing but even just in constructing law and a government and a civilization is never going to be perfect right from the start. That's kind of the point of the human race is that we learn from our mistakes as time goes on. Right. And I think, honestly, for me, having done this research and thought about it for a little while, I I think their position as framers, as founders, and as leaders of philosophical and political thought kind of makes it worse in a way that they still were involved in the slave trade. I I almost fault somebody like Jefferson, who clearly had the intellect to work his way through the moral quandary of the slave trade. I don't even know why it's a moral quandary, but, you know. Well, I think we're going to get a little bit into two of our bigger catchphrases on the podcast. First of all, we haven't talked about slavery in a very long time. So it's important that we reiterate our number one stance here that slavery is bad. And that's going to be a a theme of the episode, of course. But also that we do say a lot that it was the times. And it's just kind of not to use that as a caveat that we can justify some of the, the ways that they treated people or the less humane things that people then maybe got away with. But yeah, we're definitely a much more evolved progressive society today than they were 250 years ago so 
that's not saying that it was okay to own other humans or that slavery was ever a good thing, but obviously even the most, I don't want to say conservative because that's not the right term, but like the most people that would say that the constitution was perfect and nothing should have ever changed in the history of our country are not going Mm -hmm. to say that slavery is a good thing and that we should re-implement slavery in the country. Even the least progressive people in our society would still agree that slavery is bad and that's not something that we should have in an evolved society like we have today. But that was just, that's how the world was then. That's how economy was formed. That's just how our country was built on the backs of slaves for better or for worse, mostly for worse. (laughs) Exactly. Right. And I think maybe this is a good place to kind of jump in because the, I mean, the fact of the matter is, regardless of whether or not they own slaves, all of the founding fathers benefited from an economy, like you just said, that was, you know, largely a product of slave labor. But to kind of list the major founding father players and their attachments or involvement in slavery, uh, I want to start with Jefferson, just because I think even though he's not George Washington and the first president and all that, I mean, he's the writer of the declaration and I think he's kind of the most prominent for as far as people knowing specific things about his life. But, you know, as I said, Thomas Jefferson wrote the famous words in our declaration of independence, all men are created equal. And at the same time that he wrote that phrase, he owned slaves. He secretly kept an enslaved woman as a mistress and regarded black people as inferior, childlike, untrustworthy, and of course, as property, according to a 2002 article by Stephen Ambrose in the Smithsonian Magazine. So there's this almost dichotomous cognitive dissonance that I get because, you know, you write this one phrase, and I understand it all hinges on that word men and what that meant to whoever said or spoke or thought that phrase. Uh, And unfortunately, I don't think at the time they really were extending the word (laughs) men to really mean all humans, right? Well, we talked about that a little bit on the um, Bartolome de las Casas episode. That was our last like big slavery episode was just the fact that a lot of times these slaves weren't necessarily viewed as human. So when you refer to men, you probably are talking about just free men, not necessarily anyone who is a human right to be fair at times he did condemn slavery with his words and did attempt to prevent its westward expansion he was definitely far less effective in his efforts than i think his intellect and position in our country should have warranted and that was a point also brought up by mr ambrose from the smithsonian where he said like i've i've mentioned a couple times Thomas Jefferson certainly had the moral philosophical intellect to work through the evil of slavery. And I think on some level he did, but as you said, as was the times and he didn't really make many strides in terms of putting that condemnation into actual tangible action. I think part of our problem with that is just the fact that there weren't necessarily good examples of people that were speaking out against slavery. And I'm sure that there were, that's probably someone that we should, you know, look up for one of our future podcast episodes as someone who was a very big slave activist right in the early right. days of our country, but you didn't have that from a presidential leader standpoint. So someone like Thomas Jefferson, who was more vocal about slavery, at least in his words and maybe not in his action gets a lot more credit for being more progressive than some of the other big slave owners from that time. Right. The second, I think, in terms of people's ideas of the Founding Fathers, of course, would be George Washington. And we'll be talking more about him today than any of these others. Uh, But as we'll see today, he also held contradictory beliefs regarding the status of black people's right to freedom. He, too, owned and profited from enslaved people's labor, searching for loopholes in anti-slavery legislation to preserve his status as a slave owner. Washington did free his slaves in his will, pending Martha's passing, though she freed them within a year of his death. So I guess I feel like maybe it's a little bit better than Thomas Jefferson, but the two definitely were the two of the biggest slave owners. It's estimated that they both owned individually 600 plus slaves among them, and that was (laughs) several times more than 
you know, anybody in third place who I believe was James Madison, who had about 200 or 300. But he also at times expressed a wish to see an end to slavery, but built his wealth again with slave labor. Despite opposing the African slave trade, in his later years, he defended the westward expansion of slavery, opposite of Thomas Jefferson. He did not free his slaves in his will. Okay, so this might be a bit of a stretch, and not obviously equating the two at all because slavery is one thing whereas like wealth inequality that we're gonna i'm gonna bring up here is obviously a very different issue that Mm -hmm. would be more appropriate to our time period but would you kind of consider these types of vocally progressive standpoints but still owning slaves sort of in the same vein as like a liberal politician today who talks about how we need all these programs and benefits for lower income people but they also have millions of dollars and are looking for tax loopholes to benefit themselves and aren't being the ones to put their money where their mouth is yes i i mean you remove the entire moral issue of slavery but yes i think it's a similar type of hypocritical thought and in researching this episode i was repeatedly brought back to the same feeling which is that Politics hasn't changed since 1776. It's no different today than it was then in terms of the capacity to hold beliefs publicly, publicly state certain beliefs, but then also take action in direct contradiction of those beliefs. That's been a political thing. That's, I think, (laughs) always will be a political thing when you're talking about people looking for power and needing to govern unfortunately but yeah it's just a common theme of like laws apply to society as a whole but when you try to apply them to me it it you know it's a little closer yeah. to home and I, I don't think they should be applied to me in that way but i guess sure you know there's there's clearly a difference between owning slaves and just other less important issues that we are focused <laughs> on today <laughs> right Benjamin Franklin also owned slaves, though only a few compared to the aforementioned founders. Not that slavery should be a numbers game. I think once you own one human being, you're wrong. (laughs) True. (laughs) Alexander Hamilton didn't own slaves himself, but he did marry into a slaveholding family. Don't want to burst everybody's favorite founding father bubble, but he wasn't perfect either. In fact, of the first seven presidents, John Adams and his son John Quincy Adams were the only two who never owned slaves. John Adams opposed slavery morally and politically and believed the revolution would not be complete without its abolition. And he stated that publicly. Wow. However, both father and son did benefit from slave labor, like I talked about. It was a major driver of the early American economy, and they also had no problem keeping friends with and regularly attending parties hosted by slave owners. This is a little nitpicky, I suppose, if we're talking about the grand scheme of things relative to the other founding fathers, but it's unfair, I think, to say that they were without fault as far as being involved. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of, if we're going to keep making the comparison of income inequality being an issue today, like there are probably lots of wealthy people who do give a lot to charity or to programs that are benefiting things like that but sure they probably still use amazon or they're friends with people that run these major corporations or have investors or benefit from being business partners and things like that like the whole reason people are successful whether it's politically or in business or in any other capacity in life it's because you network with people who aren't exactly like you it, it helps to have right. friends <laughs> exactly so Luckily, we're not going to spend the entire episode talking about the Founding Fathers and white European men doing, you know, making poor moral choices. In fact, the hero of our episode is one of the slaves that belonged to George Washington, in fact, and her name was Ona Judge. Ona Judge, or Oni, as she was later called by the Washingtons, was born at Mount Vernon around the year 1774. She was the daughter of an enslaved seamstress named Betty and Andrew Judge, a white English tailor who was an indentured servant to Washington from 1772 to 1784. Washington 
does not seem to have recognized Ona as Andrew Judge's child, which might indicate that Andrew himself did not admit paternity. That seems kind of weird. Like, do we know for sure that Andrew was her father? I don't. I, I don't know that we know for sure. For sure. I mean, this is in that time of history where record keeping isn't perfect, and there aren't, you know, a ton of solid sources. But I, I think it's fair to accept that he likely was her father. I think it would be, you know, with the way the two classes of people, the two like white people and black people viewed each other, or I suppose how white people viewed black people, it would be in, I don't know, in Andrew's interest to not admit to having born. Yeah. I guess you didn't necessarily say Betty and Andrew are not married. I'm assuming. Right. Okay. Do we know anything about Andrew's situation? Like why is he an indentured servant? You know what? I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. I believe he, there was... Uh, I remember reading something about him coming over and you got free passage to the United States if you agreed to indentured servitude. Hmm. That is like a memory that's stuck in my mind that I'm not entirely <laughs> sure is factual. So fact check that before you go telling anybody else, listeners. <laughs> um, but I, I believe it was to earn his way into the United States from... The UK. Okay, well that sounds good, so I'll, I'll take your word for it. I'm like 82% sure that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Not 83. Ona, her mother Betty, and younger sister Delphi were part of the Custis estate. Two years before her marriage to Washington, Martha was married to a wealthy Virginian named Daniel Park Custis. His death left her a young widow, and the Custis family would soon become intertwined with the Washingtons, George adopting and raising two generations of Custis children. The marriage to Martha allowed George to take advantage of her ties to the Custis estate, bringing him wealth, property, and influence. So he adopted two generations of children? Were those kids from Martha's marriage to Daniel? Or yes. was it something different? No, so it would have been the first generation would have been Daniel Custis and Martha's children, and then their grandchildren. So he oh. didn't technically, I suppose, raise those grandchildren, but they were part of the household. I mean, this was a time when families lived all together in one big household, you know, multiple generations. So he didn't technically, I suppose, solo raise the grandchildren, but I guess I didn't realize they were grandparents at the time that they were married. Mm -hmm. Interesting. For Ona and Delphi, this connection meant that upon the death of Martha, they would be passed along to one of her heirs, not one of George Washington's. So legally, if they were to separate or if George were Martha were to die, the enslaved people from the Custis estate wouldn't belong to George Washington. They would belong to the next heir in the Custis family. So most likely one of the daughters, sons, granddaughters, grandsons. Born into enslavement, Ona was given a position in the household like many other mixed-race slaves due to her, quote, light, mulatto, freckled, almost white, unquote, complexion. At age 10, she became Martha Washington's personal maid. What does mulatto mean? So mulatto, which is now definitely considered a derogatory term, an offensive term, referred to people of mixed race, particularly black and white mixed people. Oh. And that, I mean, in the world of slavery, usually meant that they were assigned to a household position rather than working in <laughs> More the prominent field. position because you don't look as right. black. <laughs> goodness gracious exactly yes no that's exactly i mean as much as you say goodness gracious that's exactly yeah what the thinking was i mean it's not surprising it, it i mean that's kind of what we said that's how things were then and that's just kind of sad while working for martha washington she followed in her mother's footsteps and became a skilled seamstress after the election of george washington as the first u.s president a 15-year-old Ona traveled with seven other enslaved people to work in the executive residence. First located in New York and later Philadelphia, she was among the enslaved people whom George secretly rotated out of Philadelphia to evade the 1780 Pennsylvania Emancipation Law. 
The Gradual Abolition Act of 1780 was the first extensive abolition legislation in the Western Hemisphere. The bill stated that every, quote, Negro or mulatto child born of enslaved mothers would be considered servants to their masters until the age of 28, when they would be granted their freedom. So mm. this bill was basically meant to gradually phase out slavery. I think that was the idea behind it. And that was, you know, when I talked about Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and certain founding fathers coming out against slavery, the most commonly held belief was that it should be slowly phased out. I think because they could not see a world where the economy just kept going on after a hard stop on slavery. So this gradual phase out was pretty much the main abolition plan from early on. I mean, again, this is a terrible comparison, but it's kind of what popped into my mind because just looking at a modern perspective, it, it would be like our idea of switching to electric cars. Like you can't suddenly say that gas powered cars are banned in the United States because there's no structure for an economy that would run without right. gas powered vehicles. <laughs> so we're slowly phasing right. into like electric cars and stuff like that years down the road. And again, clearly not the same thing as slavery, but that's what kind of the foundation of the economy is at the time. And they, are looking for a way to phase out slavery slowly. <laughs> right. And But here's where I get confused, is that, so you're considered a servant to your master until the age of 28. Now, assuming like most human beings can start to have children by probably the age of like, even as young as 15 or 16, this gives you a solid 10 years to be having kids as an enslaved woman now before you're free. Yeah. So theoretically, this doesn't have to phase out slavery at yeah. all. Like this, <laughs> right? Like I didn't think of that, but as soon as you started to say it, that it makes sense. It's almost like, right? Like, again, terrible way to phrase it, but just like restocking your slave uh, inventory, if you want to call it that, like right. you're always going to have slaves because as soon as, they are free or they're old enough to be free. They've probably had children, which you now own because that's just how slavery works in this society. Right. Yeah. I mean, it would be up to the slaves, the enslaved people, I should say, to hold off if they were even able to, because let's be honest, the conception of mixed race between, you know, free white men and enslaved women wasn't always willful. Right. So, it would basically be up to the enslaved woman to try to make it to 28 without having kids because that, that child would be enslaved until 28. And mm -hmm. then you just repeat the cycle over and over and over again. <laughs> anyway, little tangent that I thought of when I, when I read the, the legislation, I was like, wait, that doesn't really have to phase out slavery at all. No, I mean, that's a good point. There's probably, probably a little bit of truth in every legislation that's written like that, that there's someone who thought of that as they wrote it and like, here's a way that we can seem like we're right. doing the right thing without exactly. actually giving up what we would have to give up. Yeah, exactly. Despite expressing his support for the bill, Washington instructed his secretary Tobias Lear and attorney general Edmund Randolph to analyze the act's provisions in order to preserve his status as a slave owner while residing in Philadelphia during his presidency. The act's emancipation requirement did not apply to non-permanent residents of Pennsylvania, provided they did not keep their enslaved workers in the state for longer than six months. Lear advised Washington to rotate his slaves, transporting them out of Pennsylvania to Mount Vernon every six months to prevent their emancipation. Washington requested to Lear that, quote, These sentiments and this advice may be known to none but yourself and Mrs. Washington and that he accomplished the rotation under pretext that may deceive both them, the enslaved, and the public. <laughs> That's terrible. I mean, in addition to just the fact that they're owning Politics. slaves, like <laughs> looking for ways to circumvent the law the way it's written, it, it's the right. definition of rules for thee, but not for me. Like he's looking for ways exactly, because he's yeah. comfortable with his slaves and he doesn't want to give them up. Right. When reading this was the first time I was like, the, the politics of our country has not changed in 250 <laughs> years. Like, it truly hasn't. Like, this is literally something I could replace. I feel like I could replace these names with, like, 
the Nixon administration, like we talked about in Watergate, or really almost any administration that does, if there are any that don't, I don't, I, I can't name them, but I feel like most politicians at times have found ways to skirt the rules. And yeah, here's the way that you can make loopholes. the laws not apply to you. Just make sure that it's on the DL. Like nobody really talks about what right. you're doing here. <laughs> yeah. Among the enslaved people transported across state lines for this purpose were Washington's cook, Hercules, his valet, Christopher Shields, and Martha's maid, Ona Judge. You know what? The Washingtons are the real victims here. Because how inconvenient would it be to, for George and Martha that they keep having to rotate their slaves in and out of their residence? I know. I know. What a, what a hardship. Yeah, like you have your, your preferred cook for almost six months, then you got to send them down to Virginia for a little bit and bring someone else in. It, it would be the worst. <laughs> yeah, just it really put upon the Washington family. In you a know way you're that... just dreading that meal that you're about to sit down for because it's not as good as Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> During Washington's presidency, Judge continued to work as Martha's maid, helping her bathe and dress, cleaning and mending clothing, organizing her personal effects, and anything else she required. In Philadelphia, life was different for people enslaved by the Washingtons than it had been at Mount Vernon. Judge and other household slaves did receive small amounts of cash on several occasions to go see a play or a circus in town. They were provided with high-quality clothing due to... They were provided with high-quality clothing due to their visible position in the house, as we talked about, and the city's large population of free black people and Quaker abolitionists offered new ideas, new connections, and new opportunities to escape. And if you recall, if you're a longtime listener, we talked about the Quaker abolitionists, or the Quakers in general, on our second episode with Lizzie Maggi, as they were a more progressive group of people. It's a real throwback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she finds herself in Philadelphia in an environment that provides for a little bit more encouragement and knowledge and the ability to escape enslavement and earn their freedom. But before we get into Ona Judge's flight, we are going to take a short break and we will be right back. Matt, you like coffee, right? I love coffee. Would you ever want to buy me a coffee? Anytime, Phil. Just say the word. You know, our dedicated listeners could also buy me a coffee. Could they buy me a coffee as well? They could buy you a coffee. This sounds fantastic. We set up this service called Buy Me a Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And people can buy us a coffee? Yeah. It's really just a way for people to support the show if they enjoy the show. And if they're listening to the show, we sure hope you enjoy it. Yeah, otherwise you're just, I mean, wasting your time. At buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side, there's three ways that our listeners can interact with the show. Number one, you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member for $10 a month or a hundred dollars a year being a member gains you some pretty cool perks you get access to our monthly bonus episode history's b-side battles access to our future episode queue a name shout out on a future episode we'll also send you a handwritten thank you postcard and sticker set and more perks will be announced as we continue on there's also some different extras that people can get on our buy me a coffee website things like choosing the topic for a future episode. If there's a person, lesser known person in history that you have an interest in, let us know and we'll do an episode all about them. You can also buy sets of custom postcards, sticker sets, and future merchandise that we add on there as well. Or you can draft your own advertisement script and we will promote whatever you want in a segment like this. The website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. Matt? Yeah? You owe me a coffee. Oh. Do I get a coffee too? You're buying. All right. 
All right, welcome back. So we've heard a little bit about Ona Judge's life as an enslaved woman under the Washingtons in the Washington household during his presidency. And now we're going to jump into the story of her escape to freedom. On May 21st, 1796, just as the Washingtons were preparing for their summer return to Mount Vernon, Ona Judge fled. She recalled during her famous 1845 interview by abolitionist newspaper journalist, quote, Whilst they were packing up to go to Virginia, I was packing to go. I didn't know where. For I knew that if I went back to Virginia, I should never get my liberty. I had friends among the colored people of Philadelphia, had my things carried there beforehand, and left Washington's house while they were eating dinner. So, obviously not defending slavery in any form but it does seem like as one of the president's slaves in new york that she would have been treated better than most slaves at the time especially like slaves working down on southern plantations the way we kind of typically perceive them Mm -hmm. what i guess drove her toward fleeing like was it just the simple fact of wanting freedom or did she have some kind of personal objection to the washingtons or A little bit of both. A little bit of both. In that interview that she gave, uh, the first reason she gave for wanting to flee was simply that she wanted to be free, which Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, we can't really fault her for that. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, Second was a little bit of the objection part. She overheard that she would soon be passed down to Martha's eldest granddaughter, Eliza Park Custis, who was known for her fierce temper. Ona stated that she, quote, was determined never to be her slave. So there was kind of the threat of worse treatment on the horizon for Ona. I do think it's factually correct to say that she at this time was treated better than a lot of slaves were being treated, uh, simply because of her position as a household servant um, and like you said, being a slave of a family like the Washingtons in a city like New York or Philadelphia. But either way, you're still a slave. Exactly. Two days after her escape, the hired steward for the executive residence, Frederick Kitt, placed an advertisement in the Philadelphia Gazette and Daily Advertiser. The ad announced that, quote, Oni Judge had absconded from the president's house and offered a $10 reward for her capture, which honestly, like, I don't, like, we don't have the inflation calculator this far back, but $10 doesn't seem like that much. I think I looked it up and it's not an exact, like, inflation, exact amount, I guess, but $10 then would have had, as this website said, the buying power of about $200 today. So like, just, like, just over $200, which is, I mean people offer more than $200 for a lost dog today. True. So <laughs> true. <laughs> a human is a little bit different, but I right. guess they're not necessarily viewing slaves as human. It's more property. <laughs> right. So he offers this $10 reward for her capture. Kit described Ona as a young woman with black eyes and bushy black hair of middle stature, slender and delicately formed having with her many changes of good clothes, all sorts. He warned that she might be trying to pass as a free slave to escape on a ship leaving the port of Philadelphia. And Kit was right about her method of transport. Ona secured passage on the ship Nancy, commanded by Captain John Bowles, and headed for Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Judge never revealed the captain's name until his death. Judge never revealed the captain's name until his death, lest they should punish him for bringing her away. Was he white, Captain John Bowles? Yeah, yeah. So he was a white man, and he had a similar feeling for her. She, He didn't mention, he knew she was on board. He didn't necessarily know she belonged to the commander-in-chief, but <laughs> he knew that she was a runaway slave, and for both her good and his, he failed to mention anything about her being on his boat because there were pretty harsh punishments for helping a slave to escape. I mean, granted he probably was a very progressive person if he's helping a slave escape, but Mm 
can you imagine finding out that the slave that you helped escape belonged to the president? Oh my god! Like he is either no. terrified because he knows it's going to be so much worse if he gets caught, or he's like right. super excited because he like believes in this helping slaves become free, and he's like, "Yeah, we stuck it to the president." <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But it was really dangerous to help a, a slave escape. You could be put to death. You could be put in prison. It certainly wasn't something you would want to advertise. Yeah, for sure. Back at the residence, George Washington was stewing, which I kind of love. <laughs> As we mentioned, I just picture him like pacing back and forth in his executive residence, so angry about this escaped <laughs> slave. As we mentioned, Ona was owned by the Custis estate, and George would actually be responsible for reimbursing the estate of Martha's late first husband, were she not recovered. He also faced pressure from Martha, who was distressed by the loss of her maid, and Washington claimed was brought up and treated more like a child than a servant. Unable to understand why she would flee, Washington came to believe she was, quote, seduced and enticed away by a Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> as as we all so often are <laughs> i'm gonna start using that in my everyday life what someone if I, like, like, where were you phil yeah. i got enticed by a frenchman <laughs> just can't find someone oh they must have got seduced and enticed by a frenchman yeah i mean it's a logical conclusion if somebody goes missing right <laughs> to be fair it probably was a lot more logical in the late 1700s than it would I mean, be today probably that's that's fair those it's just funny for Frenchmen. me to think. Like, I picture this like caricature, cartoonish Philadelphia with like dozens of, <laughs> I don't know, swag heavy Frenchmen hitting on women <laughs> and people's enslaved women trying to get them to run away with them. Maybe, who knows? Bonjour, mon ami. <laughs> <laughs> Despite being in a more progressive state that was abolitionist heavy, like New Hampshire, Ona still was not safe. A few months after her arrival, a friend of Martha's youngest granddaughter, Nellie Park Custis, recognized Judge on the street. Word of the escapee's whereabouts reached George, who enlisted Joseph Whipple, the customs collector in Portsmouth, to aid in her return. Whipple found Judge and tried to convince her to board a ship and return to Philadelphia. She replied that she would readily return only if the Washingtons promised to free her after their deaths. Otherwise, she should rather suffer death than return to the slavery and be liable to be sold or given to any other person. Which I think is a fair, like, you don't know, if you get sold, you don't know who you're going to get sold to. It could be yeah. worse than the temper tantrum granddaughter, you know, <laughs> it could be to the South where you will be treated much worse and... Uh, I, I totally get that, you know, that demand of hers. She assured Whipple that there was no seduction by a Frenchman, <laughs> but rather a simple thirst for complete freedom had been her only motive for absconding. No, no, it's got to be the Frenchman. <laughs> Definitely the Frenchman. I guess I don't understand why she is allowed to make a request. Not that, like, obviously she's going to choose her fate here, but... Why didn't this guy just grab her and take her back to the Washington family? Right. I mean, this surprised me, too, as we are sadly really used to hearing about much more violent instances of slave capture and more violent laws surrounding the capture of slaves. Yeah. As we'll see in a moment, New England had large communities of free black people and Quaker abolitionists, as I previously mentioned, and Washington was worried they would riot if Ona were to be taken back forcefully. It almost seems as though, at least in the public opinion sphere of this time, slavery was closer to abolition during the revolutionary years than in the years before the Civil War. This is complete speculation on my part, but it's just this kind of vibe I got from reading about how things were at the times. Like, I don't know, I'm used to Jim Crow era or Civil War era history when it comes to slavery and and civil rights and the freedom of black people and i don't know i'm used to hearing like i said much more horrendous examples of slavery capture than obviously contained here i mean it just seems that 
whether it's Whipple or Washington or Whipple ap- acting on behalf of Washington, like they would have been well within yeah. his legal right to just take her and bring her back to mm-hmm. her rightful slave owner. But it would have been legal. Yeah, it, it's. I guess it's just weird to me that she's allowed to make her case to him or to not go with him. Like she's able to kind of have that choice sort of not, I mean, not really have that choice, but like she's able to kind of talk her way out of it. Right. I mean, even in this day, well, I, I, mean, I guess I see it from the political standpoint. Like it, it does make sense that he doesn't want to have a violent recapturing of his slave because as the yeah. president, it would look really bad in an area where it is a little bit more progressive and there are more free slaves. I guess, that's exactly it i'm trying it, to look at it from the uh the the what makes washington look better in the public eye here versus i guess the slave's perspective which is wanting freedom <laughs> exactly and that leads perfectly into the next point which is that washington had signed the federal fugitive slave law in 1793 which retained the right of slave owners to recapture enslaved people who had escaped across state lines with force if necessary Like you said, as president, Washington knew that attempting to violently capture Ona would likely lead to anger amongst anti-slavery citizens of northern states. Washington did instruct Whipple to continue his efforts to recapture Ona only if it would not excite a mob or riot. Little is known about Whipple's subsequent efforts at finding her, but if he was ever close, she certainly evaded him. In 1797, Ona married a man by the name of Jack Staines, a free black sailor. The couple would go on to have three children, Eliza, Will, and Nancy. In August of 1799, Washington made one final attempt to find and recapture Judge. He enlisted the help of Martha's nephew, Burwell Bassett Jr., who was traveling to Portsmouth, New Hampshire for business. There, Bassett successfully located Judge, but she again refused after he tried to persuade her to return. Though Washington asked Bassett to avoid any methods that were, quote, unpleasant or (laughs) troublesome, Bassett was determined to take Ona by force. He announced his plans over dinner at the home of John Langton, a U.S. senator from New Hampshire who was sympathetic to the abolitionist cause. Langton promptly and secretly sent a message to warn Judge. Wow, we actually have a rare, like good guy on our podcast who's (laughs) helping out the victim here. My mind is blown. (laughs) But also, okay... Burwell Bassett Jr. is a bad dude in this story, but what a great name. Burwell Bassett Jr. I'm like kind of disappointed that he's the bad guy because that's such a good name. Or maybe it's the perfect name for a bad guy. I think it's a good name for a bad guy. Burwell. It also sounds like, I don't know, it sounds like an actor or a comedian. (laughs) Like, welcome to the stage, Burwell Bassett. (laughs) No, he's got to be British. I mean, I know, like, he, Burwell Bassett. he's from America, but he probably came from England or something like that. That's a British name. Yeah, for sure. Upon receiving the warning and her husband at sea, she took her firstborn one-year-old Eliza in her arms and hired a horse and carriage to take her to the home of a friend and free black woman named Nancy Jack. They successfully reached Jack's home eight miles from Portsmouth in Greenland, New Hampshire. After Washington's death in December of 1799, Judge said the family never troubled me anymore. Despite this, Ona still remained a fugitive. The Custis estate could legally recapture her and her children at any time, regardless of what the Washingtons wished. By the time of Ona's 1840 interview, she was still living in Nancy Jack's home in Greenland. Ona was legally considered a pauper and received government support from Rockingham County in New Hampshire. What is a like what does a pauper mean? In like slang everyday language, it just means a poor person, but legally it meant at this time someone who was receiving government support. Okay. I guess I've never heard it as a legal term. I mean, right. You can kind of see where that came well, from. Well, I don't I, I don't know if we use it as a legal term anymore. Right. But <laughs> Unfortunately, Ona's husband Jack had died in 1803, and all three of her children had died before her as well. Despite these hardships, she stated in the interview that her life had changed for the better since arriving in New Hampshire. She says that she never received the least mental or moral instruction of any kind while she remained in the Washington's family, 
But after she came to Portsmouth, she learned to read. And when Elias Smith first preached in Portsmouth, she professes to have been converted to Christianity. I'm actually surprised that the slaves weren't taught Christianity by default. Like that's what most slaves were raised up as. I guess. Yeah, me too. The only thing I could think with that is it's maybe just a literacy issue. Like they maybe weren't taught to read and write, so they couldn't read the Bible. And that's maybe why they, she didn't know that from birth. Yeah. I mean, I think that might've had something to do with it, but yeah, you would think that they would have immediately begun teaching you know, new slaves, Christianity. Yeah. Upon their I arrival. mean, most of the slave owners probably were Christian and it's kind of like a, a refuge for a lot of the slaves too, just to have that religion. You would think that she would have been raised as Christian, but that's interesting that she yeah. found it later in life. Yeah. Ona likely never saw her Mount Vernon family again. Her mother, Betty died in January of 1795. In 1802, her sister Delphi had been inherited by Eliza Park Custis Law, the fate that Ona had fled to avoid, as that was the granddaughter with the, quote, nasty temper. (laughs) However, Ona's determination to escape slavery eclipsed any regret over leaving. As one interviewer noted, when asked if she is not sorry she left Washington, as she has labored so much harder since than before, her reply is, no. I am free, and I have, I trust, been made a child of God by the means. So, I mean, freedom was really important to her. She left behind her mother, her sister, and a life that she knew, however unpleasant or pleasant it might have been. You know, she being a free person and getting to make her own decisions was, I think, in, in a way, really the most important thing for her. I think that's super interesting because, I mean, when you say being able to make her own decisions, it almost is like she still can't because she's still technically mm-hmm. a fugitive and she could be recaptured. Right. So her, her decisions are still being dictated by her circumstance, I guess. But she left a life of relative comfort. Like she wasn't obviously free. She still had to work and she didn't really have much that was hers. But if you're living with the president and you're a better treated slave in a wealthy family, that's probably a better, I don't want to say better life or better circumstance because it's not, but it's a more comfortable living arrangement than being on the run, I would think. But that's just how important this freedom was, was that she was confidently more satisfied being not a slave, being free, being... right on her own even if she is on the run versus being in a situation where she is owed to someone that everything that she does is the choice of someone else yeah yeah i mean i think i mean the price of freedom is high and the value of it is high and you know in the same way that a lot of people look at the founding fathers and their sacrifices for freedom i think you can also look at ona judge and what she sacrificed for hers It's definitely something that we take for granted as white people living in the 21st century who have never really felt any kind of oppression for anything. Absolutely. Shortly after her interview in 1848, Ona Judge Staines passed away. She left behind a legacy, of course, of being the famous runaway slave from George Washington's residence and kind of a mark of, you know, one of the more well-known remarkable examples of an enslaved person escaping for their freedom. The executive residence in Philadelphia was eventually torn down in 1832 before her death, but there today stands an exhibit honoring Ona and the eight other enslaved people who worked in the home. The exhibit features footsteps embedded in the ground, representing her flight to freedom. Hmm. Author Erica Armstrong Dunbar's book, Never Caught, the Washington's relentless pursuit of their runaway slave, Ona Judge, takes an in-depth look at Ona's life and journey to freedom and was a National Book Award finalist. Some of the information for this episode, in fact, came from that very book. I was going to say, this is the one that you were reading a long time. I know you want to do this episode yes. several weeks ago, but you were want to make sure you got through this book first. Yeah, yeah, it was, I mean, it's a great read. There's way more information than we presented here and a lot more storytelling elements. You learn a lot more about her life. 
In fact, that's where I read, you asked a question earlier about her father, Andrew Judge, and why he was an indentured servant. And that's where I read that. So, I mean, it was weeks ago when I read that. That's why it's like buried in my memory. Oh, that's cool. But yeah, I mean, I definitely, if you found this episode interesting, I definitely recommend finding a local Black-owned bookstore and (laughs) ordering it. In addition, and I found this to be really interesting, just a really cool idea and a cool piece of artwork, the Absconded Project is a hybrid street performance public ritual in which performance artist Dragonfly, whose given name is Robin Laverne Wilson, personifies Judge as a living monument. She walks the streets of New York interacting with historical markers, statues, and buildings, and unscripted elements in her path. So, almost like... You know, if you've, I mean, this is a much less noble example, but like if you've been in an amusement park or at a beach where there's those like living statue (laughs) performers that freeze and then scare you, it's similar to that, but with a little bit more historical meaning behind it. And she does state uh, that this work of hers was heavily influenced by Dunbar's book that I mentioned. So it's kind of her way of memorializing Judge. And I kind of want, like, I don't know when I'm going to be in New York again or how to find this, but it, I think it would be fun to find her. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Maybe we can add that to our list of historical things right after the uh, the fur rendezvous <laughs> yeah. in Fort Bridger. I think we've got a few things from our episodes that we need to travel to visit. So yeah. you and I got to open up our schedules a little bit so we can get on that. Yeah, we'll see about that. I don't know. I don't know how uh, how close that is to happening. Once we hit it big and we can go on tour with our podcast and, you know, all those millions of listeners that we have that everyone wants to hear what we're talking about. Yeah. Tell your friends. Get a couple of our... <laughs> the more people that listen, the more we can focus on this. Get a couple of our international episodes so we can do a bit of traveling too. People love when we talk yeah. about traveling. Have we gotten that feedback? <laughs> I don't know, but we didn't talk about it all in this episode, so I had to throw it in there. I've been to Colonial Williamsburg. (laughs) All right, let's get to the quiz. That's all I got. All right, we'll be right back. (laughs) Establishing connection to ScienceNet. Executive protocol. Relaunch. Science. What is it? Who does it? Why does it matter? The Science Night podcast answers these questions and showcases the latest in science news and discoveries. Join us every other Friday to meet the scientists behind the science and the stories behind the work. Learn more at Scinite.com. That's S-C-I-N-I-G-H-T.com. The Science Night Podcast is a proud member of the River Power Podcast Mill. Find out more at riverpower.xyz. When we decided to make a podcast, the first thing we did was download Anchor. Because we have no money, and Anchor is free. You can also record and edit your podcast right from your phone or a computer. Then, it only takes one click to share your podcast to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. And because we have no money... Anchor helps pair us with advertisers and lets our listeners support the History's B-Side podcast directly on our page. If you've got an idea for your own podcast, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. All right, it's time for today's quiz segment of the episode. We like to end every episode with just a short three-question quiz kind of test out today's host, see how much he studied in and around his topic. And maybe you, the listener, knows a little bit about it as you came into today, and you might be able to guess some of these as we go on. Are you ready for your quiz? I sure am. I'm not sure how difficult it'd be. I I feel like this is an easier one. I would say that two of the questions don't necessarily have to do with the topic specifically, but you may have come across them yeah in your research um the first one i'll start with the one that i just think is super fun and interesting not at all related to own a judge but it's related to george washington and sort of the topic 
So you might know this from your elementary school studies. What were George Washington's teeth made from? Of course, his dentures. He, he's famous for not having had his real teeth, his dentures. What were they made from? I mean, I think a lot of people believe they were made of wood, but I've also read that they were they possibly were made of slave teeth. That's a very- so I don't know. I don't know which one I'm going to like double down on. I'm going to go with slave teeth. That's a very good guess. Wood is the common misconception. That's always the rumor that we tell elementary schoolers. Um, I would say that slave teeth is sort of half right. So Mm -hmm. they weren't wood. That's kind of the, the main point here is that they were probably miscolored from years of wear and tear that made them maybe resemble wood. But they were actually constructed out of <laughs> ivory, which probably came from elephants, uh, certain alloys like lead, tin, silver, copper, brass, um, and like you said, actual real teeth. But those could have come from cows, horses, and yes, at times, humans. So there is some record of when he lost his real teeth that he had his dentist save and preserve them to build his dentures out of his own actual teeth but there were other teeth that he purchased so it's not like he knocked slaves teeth out and then took them and made dentures out of them he did purchase them from slaves but you can probably assume that the slaves necessarily didn't have an option if the right yeah, you know he wanted to buy their teeth and they probably weren't paid the same as they would be if the teeth came from other people sure that's kind of a big uh people people in the revolutionary times were they were gross what is this elephant teeth he's got lead in his mouth i mean Good that's Lord. just a comment on the state of dental medicine at the time we've come a long way yeah it was horrific <laughs> <laughs> no it's the beauty of science and medicine we've come a long way since using you have come along thankfully good god brass alloy (laughs) teeth and horses and other humans Ugh. all right for a less gross question (laughs) why was ona judge promised to martha washington's granddaughter Mm. i don't know the answer to that i truly do not this is going to kind of go into the just how slaves were viewed i guess she was actually a wedding gift oh wow yeah so uh the washingtons were unable to attend the wedding of elizabeth park custis and thomas law so they invited the couple to honeymoon at the president's house in philadelphia and as their gift promised to bequeath oni to her as their wedding gift as a slave that she would have later on in life um and as you mentioned in the episode once she fled, the Washingtons gave her sister Delphi to Eliza Park instead. So they switched out their wedding gift. Yeah, which kind of makes the Washingtons seem a little cheap, Tacky. don't you think? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, it's, uh, I can't even wrap my mind around that. <laughs> like, honey, look, Aunt Jack got us a crock pot, a toaster, and a human. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> like, my mind went to like the bratty girl in. Willy Wonka, who's like, but I want oh, that yeah. one. <laughs> but that's just like a horrible way to view human beings. That's how they did, though. I mean, that's like we keep saying that's a horrible way, but like that probably wasn't yeah uncommon thinking, unfortunately. Yeah, you're right. That's just as we've said, not good, bad stuff. I actually was having this thought, and I know we're digressing from the quiz a little bit but i read something the other day that was like obviously this isn't one of our happier episodes like there's less like fun stuff to talk about i mean i guess it's kind of happy that she got her freedom in the end but we we couldn't really necessarily joke around as much on this episode as we did but i read something the other day that was something about how history should make you angry because it's imperfect and there's a Mm -hmm. lot of bad things that happen and it's good to learn about that stuff and if you read history and you're just you're only reading the good things and you're only happy about what you read you're not really reading history because yeah oh i totally agree with that so the best history books i've read have literally made me like 
breakdown <laughs> and have like a anger i don't know not not panic attack but like definitely made me angry and sad and yeah yeah i mean it's it's fun when we can joke around our episodes but like and one like this it's kind of like we're joking at the expense of how bad some people were and while also recognizing you know the more serious and important parts of it too totally so we'll end on a slightly more happy question i guess number three on june 19th of this year which is the first time that america celebrated juneteenth as a national holiday a historical marker was dedicated to oni judge where was it unveiled where was it located Mm. last year on juneteenth this year 2021 so like 2021 on Juneteenth. Oh, a little man. over a month ago, as we're recording this, obviously, further back for people hearing it for the first time. Well, I mean, the residents I talked about, so I don't feel like that's it. Maybe Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Well, that's a good guess. It's actually very close to Washington's Mount Vernon estate. It was dedicated oh, by okay. the Virginia Department of Historical Resources. It's actually on Mount Vernon Highway, because I believe it's hmm. a highway marker. But it was unveiled on Juneteenth this year and just dedicating the life of Oni Judge in George Washington's residence. Interesting. Yeah. Good little memorial to her. Yeah. That's cool that happened just now, like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And obviously with Juneteenth being kind of not a new holiday, but the first time that we've really recognized it as a country, she is a good character or person in black history that we should recognize as someone that's a part of that that Mm. culture that history that might have been overlooked and glad we're doing a podcast about her good topic choice yeah yeah it was a fun topic to research i like you said it's not like pleasant material but she's an interesting woman and it was i don't know it was kind of fun to get a different view on george washington in in like a not fun way but it was just interesting you know do you want to end our podcast on kind of a interesting discussion or should we just end it why is there is there an interesting discussion you want to have do you think we should be tearing down monuments and statues to these founding fathers hmm Ooh. you know i think it depends i do um I don't know that that's a tough one. Anybody, anybody that was involved in the Confederacy down period, as far as I'm concerned, like there's no reason as far as I'm concerned, they're traitors to the country and we might as well have statues of Nazis. But as far as like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington is concerned, I don't know. That's a hard, hard question. I also think it's a bit of like a, a, I don't know. It's an ethereal conversation because it would involve, I mean, tearing down major structures in Washington, D.C. that I just don't see happening. Or renaming. Um, and Or renaming, true. But I also, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, these were certainly imperfect men, and it does not excuse what they did. They were hypocritical. They did not fully use their capacity for intellect and empathy and moral judgment to you know, really ride a consistent line of logical thought as far as slavery goes. And I think they should be remembered in that way. They, that should, that should be part of the story. Also part of the story should be the sacrifice. I suppose they made, like we said, it was dangerous to do what they did. And frankly, America got really good at, (laughs) you know, making other people suffer for its, benefit but it wasn't the first one to do it and i mean it was already we were already part of the british colonial empire and fighting against it so i don't consider the revolution and the beginning of america itself to be an inherently immoral i don't know uh, bad thing that we should or not a race but we shouldn't celebrate you know i think the the beginning of america did have a lot of positive things and our country does have positive things to offer 
It's taken us a long time to get there and to work through a lot of these problems. But I don't know. I don't think as far as like the founding founding fathers that the statues should necessarily be torn down. I also think it depends on the, the community they are in. I don't like, as far as I'm concerned, if it's an avenue in the middle of, you know, since we've decided we're going to redline communities and still have segregated communities, if it's in the middle of a black neighborhood, I, I think they should decide what goes on their street corner. You know what <laughs> I mean? Fair. I don't understand why the whole country and all of Reddit and Facebook and Instagram get to have an opinion about something that's miles and miles away that I never have to look at. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, that's a vague answer, but I agree with you. I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's a good right or wrong answer. I guess not that either of our opinions really matter. Like we're not deciding what right. monuments stay up in the country, but I don't think that you can take down monuments to Washington. I think there are certain places that you can, like you said, but I don't think any monument to Washington is erected in the idea of him being a slave owner. So my, no. my general idea is that you, you can't write the story. You can't tell the story of America without talking about George Washington in the same sense. Exactly. You can't necessarily tell the story of America without brushing on the civil war and the fact that there was a Confederacy. But when you talk about a monument, it's to honor someone for what they did. And I think when you recognize right. the Confederacy, you can tell the story. There are history books that exist and plenty of articles and websites that will talk about the Confederacy and all that it stood for. But it's not really right. anything that you want to honor or monumentalize. Memorialize. Yeah. Right. And I guess in the same sense when you... I think the entire, like, you're erasing history argument is so asinine that I can't even believe human beings actually uttered the words and thought it was a good <laughs> idea. Because it's like... How much of history have you learned from looking at statues? Please tell me now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, th I think the same argument can be made for, and this is probably going to open another can of worms that we don't necessarily need to get into because we talked about it a lot on our Bartolome de las Casas episode, but Christopher Columbus, yeah. like when we have a statue or anything dedicated to him, it's not referring to the way that he treated indigenous people. It's referring to his discovery of the what we now know as America. So it, I mean, in some way that sure. is worth monumentalizing, but there is understandably some atrocities that come along with it, and maybe our level of tolerance is kind of dependent right. on how that story ended. Like, Washington may yeah. have found ways to skirt around the slavery laws, but in the end, he did say that he didn't believe slavery was right, and he did try to free his slaves at his death, so... Should we honor him? Yes. Should we recognize the wrong that he may have done in his life? Yes. That's a part of history too. I agree with that. I will take a hard stand on Christopher Columbus. I don't think Christopher Columbus discovered North America. He wasn't even the first European here. <laughs> and I frankly, it just baffles my mind. I, I'm sure there's some weird, corrupt, goofy reason why he was the chosen one to celebrate, but I don't I just don't see the value in what his accomplishments were it, it, up against George Washington. Like George Washington was, uh, the, I mean, elected the first president of our country and self-installed the term limit. He, yeah, like, no, I'm not who wanted him to be king. <laughs> I'm not. And he was saying like, no, that I we should put king, Christopher like... Columbus on par with George Washington. <laughs> like clearly, I think George yeah. Washington had a much bigger impact on our country today than C Christopher Columbus did. I just like right. I understand the merit in both. I it's hard to come up with a stance that is truly like this is one we should honor. This is one that we should tear down. I think it kind of depends on what you're celebrating, but there is a lot of gray area that comes with someone like Christopher Columbus. It's not as clear a line as it is with, you know, yeah. maybe a, a true founding father who built the country versus someone who tried to secede and tear away from the country and fight against it <laughs> totally i mean i think the statue conversation will become pretty irrelevant once you know everybody of all types all colors all races all ethnicities all genders will experience the same level of complete freedom as each other and now to link back to one of our other episodes since we haven't mentioned enough on this one 
go listen to Polly Murray, who talked about freedom and all people experiencing it equally. Yeah. As always, we really appreciate your support, your interest, your attention to our weekly episodes. As listeners, we appreciate that you enjoy listening to us and we enjoy, we certainly enjoy researching and producing these episodes for you. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or just want to reach out, you can always find us at historiesbside at gmail.com or YouTube, Facebook, Instagram at historiesbside. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service. And follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.